Keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast on our Instagram handle at the Wolf Connection pod or email us your questions, comments, and guest ideas to podcast at wolfconnection.org. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. Stephen and I are really excited to have these two gentlemen on the podcast this morning, uh, both coming to us from Montana. Uh, to say that they are both legendary in their respective fields is probably an understatement. Um, many, many years of service, both for uh, grizzly bears, for wolves and others. Uh, former sen- senior wildlife biologist uh, for Yellowstone National Park and the wolf program lead for 28 years, Doug Smith and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Grizzly Bear Recovery Coordinator for 35 years, Chris Serving. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for being here this morning and discussing uh, what you guys said prior, your concerns about uh, some of the wildlife policies uh, that are coming down the pike. Really can't thank you guys enough. Uh, how you guys doing? We're doing good. Nice to be here. I really just want to get started too, because we've uh, we've had Doug uh, on the podcast before, but Chris, we'd love to everybody you know maybe who who doesn't know or hasn't heard of your work, just give everyone a little bit of background on on yourself, where you grew up, what's you know where did when where did bears come into the picture, and how did you get involved in, in all the work that you did? Well, I grew up in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, and as soon as I graduated from high school, I wanted to go west, and so I I went to the University of Montana. I wanted to get to to the mountains, and I did my undergraduate there, and um, I was fortunate to be a a work-study student in the Wildlife Research Unit where John Craighead was the the, um, leader of the unit, and of course, the Craigheads did all that work on, on Yellowstone. Um, and um, I was uh, I went to the University of Washington and got a master's working on bald eagles, and then I came back to the University of Montana and did a PhD on grizzly bears. And right at the time I finished, the grizzly bear recovery program was getting started, and um, I was just in the right place at the right time, and I got hired as the grizzly bear recovery coordinator to implement the recovery plan and, and push the process through and. I wasn't good at anything else, and so I did that for 35 years until I retired in 2016. <laughs> Just go into what is what was it like to be a part of that program from the start, and what were really the goals, objectives of that, and did those objectives or goals get met in the time that you were there? Well, at the time uh, that I started in 1981, the... Um, you know, the grizzly bear was in bad shape and it was recognized as um, doing really poorly, particularly in the Yellowstone ecosystem where people knew most about the bears because of the work of the Craigheads. And at that time, you know, there'd been that closure of the dumps in the late 70s and early 80s. And the um, uh, the dump closures created quite a controversy that people thought that without the dumps, the bears weren't going to be able to survive. They were 70 to 80 bears killed a year for a couple of years there as the bears transitioned out of the dumps and began to spend more time with people and they had to be removed. And there was concern that those bears would disappear. And um, after about a year or two, um, it became clear that uh, while people thought grizzly bears, you know, were in trouble, there wasn't much commitment to do much about it. And, um, And there was difficulty in trying to get all the agencies to work together and um, uh, we recognized it in that time period, about 1982, that there were perhaps only 30 adult female grizzly bears in the Yellowstone ecosystem in total. And there were very few, and they were going to disappear. And so I, I would periodically go back to Washington, D.C., to the Department of Interior and, and talk to people about how it was going. Everybody was real interested in bears at that point. And, um, you know... We had to say to people that the bears are going to disappear. You know, it's just a matter of time here because the the population had continued to decline. We weren't making much progress. And uh, with only 30 females in the system, there were only about 10 females that had cubs in any one year. And so there were very few bears left, most of them in the park. And that prompted what was called, what was 
created was called the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee, where all the agencies were forced to work together, the state agencies, the Park Service, the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the BLM. We're all brought in together under this um, committee structure. And um, we actually got the Assistant Secretaries of Interior and Agriculture to sign the MOU to implement this. And the idea was to implement the recovery plan. And uh, the governors of the four states, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and Washington, all signed that MOU too to, to implement the recovery plan and, and recover the grizzly bear. And uh, that got everybody working together and we began to make progress. And, and we are where we are today. Um, you know, we have over a thousand grizzly bears in the Yellowstone ecosystem now. And um, the bears are doing pretty well because of all the effort that went into it. But politically, things are very different. Um, imagine getting the governors of the four states to sign an MOU to implement grizzly bear recovery today. Um, we live in a politically different climate. And, um, and I think people have um, become complacent about the needs of bears and wolves. And um, uh, many people at the political level are trying to look at grizzly bears and wolves as a, um, a liability and a problem. And, um, and we don't believe they are. They're part of the natural capital of the states and they should be recognized as something that's valuable rather than something that's tried to, you know, as a problem to the states. And um, that's what Doug and I did when we wrote our paper, trying to highlight the problems to the grizzly bears and the wolves. Yeah, Doug, just piggyback off of that, j just the correlation with wolves and two bears in, in the amount of time that you were working Yellowstone and now obviously retired now. What are some of the 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 consistencies that you see with bear recovery and wolf recovery? And again, what's happening with wolves as we know? Um, moving forward in, in the political system today? Well, just one quick note that I don't know if Chris even knows this himself is a link that we have based on his biographical sketch there, which I found very interesting myself. But uh, I did my master's and PhD in a park called Voyagers National Park. Great park, love it. But a guy was sent there from Yellowstone who was part of the Grizzly Bear Wars on the Park Service side against the Craigheads. And it was a very inter interesting introduction to grizzly bears for me because I innocently went to Voyagers just struggling as a graduate student. And there's this guy there named Glenn Cole. And Glenn was the face of grizzly bear management for the Park Service. And he clashed with the Craigheads. And I went to his house several times for Thanksgiving and heard the whole grizzly bear story, the Craighead story from his view while his wife Gladys shuddered in the background because Glenn had a very hard time giving up the grizzly bear story in Yellowstone. At any rate, sorry for that diversion, but I find it a very interesting connection that Chris and I have that we didn't know. But the difference with wolves is, you know, Yellowstone in many ways was iconic for grizzly bears. I don't wanna take anything away from elk and bison but it was one of the last strongholds for grizzly bears. Wolves were very different. Wolves were eliminated from the entire West. And you could argue they weren't even close to Yellowstone. Uh, the, the wolf recovery in Northwest Montana deserves recognition and mention because they did come there naturally. Uh, Diane Boyd's got a, a memoir about that coming out, I think this fall, great book. I reviewed it for her. Um, but there was a debate if if wolves would make it to central Idaho and especially Yellowstone. And my entire time in Yellowstone, I learned that the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which is the two parks and, and two refuges and five national forests, really does function like an ecological island. Very large, 18 million acres, roughly the size of Connecticut but it's got an abrupt boundary. I know that because I flew it for thousands of hours and you're flying over wild country and boom, you hit an abrupt edge. And so the debate about wolves, would they make it through the gap from Northwest Montana, which is similar uh, good wildlife habitat, especially for carnivores to the GYE. And, and that area in between is very inhospitable to wolf movement, uh, uh, corridor ecology, all that kind of thing. And so there was a debate among wolf biologists 
uh, you know, Diane Boyd, Bob Ream, notable exceptions there, both at University of Montana, that wolves can disperse through that gauntlet of, it's not that they couldn't make it to Yellowstone, it's well within the dispersal distance of wolves. No one disagreed with that. The issue was, could they make it through the human caused mortality gauntlet, which is the leading cause of mortality for wolves in North America, Alaska, Canada, lower 48. They're shot. You know, when wolves show up, oddly, they're not that, how do I say it? They're usually fairly visible. They're usually fairly obvious. They like open country, rolling topography. Uh, they're social. They make noise in the form of howling. They're not like a cougar. They're not like a grizzly bear. Solitary, which kind of hangs to the cover, if I can say that that way with Chris on the call as well. Wolves show up and you see them. Uh, they get hit by cars more than I, I would think they would. And so the question was, can they make it through that sea of humanity to really good habitat? And a majority of wolf biologists thought, no. And they can't. So that's what triggered reintroduction. Very different than what happened in Northwest Montana with wolves and what happened in Yellowstone with, with bears, which was to curate or grow a population that never went to extirpation. And so that was an added level of trouble for wolves because it was the federal government that was behind the reintroduction. Now, the second major criteria for reintroduction was it relaxes some of the stringency of the Endangered Species Act, which in general, Western politicians do not like if you reintroduce because it invokes a clause of the Endangered Species Act, which is called experimental non-essential, which allows you more management flexibility. For example, uh, if wolves are in the act of killing livestock, you can shoot them. And if they're a fully protected and endangered species, you cannot. And there's some bureaucratic paperwork called Section 7 that was relaxed if they're experimental, not essential. So reintroduction, oftentimes, and the, the opponents, Diane's a great friend when she speaks out against it. She's very strongly against it still to this day. You know, natural cover is always better. Agreed. Um, it's not just would wolves make it or not. Okay, so that's still maybe you could say an open debate. It's that bureaucratic process that was eased that reintroduction allowed. And, and I think that often gets when people argue about the past about reintroduction, should we or shouldn't we have not done it? It's not only this debate about would they make it, it's a debate about how can we make this better for the locals who have to deal with it. Two pronged, not one pronged. And that's very key in this kind of we shouldn't have reintroduced, we should have let them come back on their own. And I think those, and then the last thing I'll say, this is a follow-up to Chris's statement, wolves are social, <laughs> bears are not. And, and that is a big difference uh, in terms of their ecology, behavior, uh, social dynamics. And, and, and that, that affects a lot of things in terms of management. Just to follow up on what you're saying there, Doug, do you think, I mean, this comes up a lot that, that folks say that if they came back naturally, it certainly would have been different in terms of social tolerance, but I don't, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Uh, it's a tough one because yeah. I used to say yes. And now I want to say no. Right. And, you know, maybe, I don't know if we're allowed to change our mind as we grow older, but you know, uh, I think it was Mark Twain who said, contradiction yourself is, is if you're not, you're not thinking correctly. But, you know, yeah, you heard a lot early that we're cramming wolves down people's throats. You know, everyone hates the federal government in the West. Right. But, you know, I don't know. Every place wolves show up, lake states, they move from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. They've been reintroduced to Colorado. Uh, they, they recovered naturally Washington, Oregon, California. There's always an outcry. There's always the sky is falling. There's always, what are we going to do with wolves? Wolves are going to end life the way we know it. You know, they're going to kill our livestock. They're going to wipe out our elk and deer. And that's whether it's natural recovery or reintroduction. And you get the misinformation that goes along with it. So I don't know. 20 years ago, I said, yeah. The federal government reintroducing wolves didn't help. Natural cover is always better. I've said that numerous times. Diane says it every time I see her. Um, I don't know. Wolves are controversially 
controversial period, no matter how they show up. What's your sense of that, Chris? Same topic. Oh, I don't know. I, I think these people, you know, that are opposed to wolves would oppose wolves if they had a natural population increase. There were a few there, kind of like grizzly bears. You know, if, if we would have had the same issue with wolves if a small population that was conserved and they increased to the numbers that are in Yellowstone today, would people be more accepting of them? I find that really hard to believe. I, I don't think so. They just, you know, they're just opposed to the idea of wolves. Wolves have this visceral response in people, you know, they just go crazy. They lose all sense of proportion. Oh, wolves, oh, they're just going to eat everything and kill all the elk. And, and we've got to save the elk and the deer from the wolves. And it doesn't, you know, reality goes out the window when people talk about wolves. Well, it's interesting because you guys, you guys have both worked on these reintroduction projects or these types of projects for so long. And you have this long-term perspective of timeline and also change over time. So I'll ask Doug first and then shoot back to Chris, but how, from your perspective, how is conservation or the approach to conservation in a general sense changed between now and, and the time you started this work, uh, at least in terms of the, the balance between science versus or, or, and politics and which one of those concepts sort of is or was more impactful to the outcomes of of conservation has there been a major change over time oh absolutely um i mean you, you know now i think everything's political um you know 30 years ago 40 years ago over 40 years ago when my career started i think we looked at biology and data and evidence and then debated it after that and that's okay, as long as that data comes first. Now it's all a political process. I think one of the main points of our paper, and Chris led on this, I think it was more his writing than mine, was is, you know, and, and one thing I was worried about, and Chris and I had some last minute conversations about the paper on the telephone, you, you know, we have colleagues with the states. They're, they're not only colleagues, they're friends. And, and, and you know, it's okay to have these professional scientific degree disagreements in print. That's what produces progress. But we pointed out in the paper, and I think this was Chris's writing, and I agreed with it, that this management has become more political now. That, that the legislatures, the governors, however that process works kind of behind the curtain, you don't, you're not letting professional wildlife biologists do their job anymore. And, you know, certainly state biologists and Chris and I are federal biologists have a different approach to wildlife management. That's fine. This is not that, though. <laughs> you know, I mean, we can work through the professional process as wildlife biologists, state and federal, like Chris just said happened with recovery of the grizzly bear and the formation of the IGBST. And, and, and that's an interagency process that worked beautifully. What is happening now is not that. Uh, secondly, I will say this, and you know, expert opinion doesn't matter anymore. All the experts now, when an expert weighs in, people discount it. Now, I'm not saying questioning expert opinion uh, isn't good. It is. Expert is called right, peer right, review. They yeah. need that check. You know, when someone is, you know, sits in the ivory tower and says whatever they want their ideas and their opinions tend to drift into a kind of never never land that is also not correct but the the other extreme the complete discounting of experts which is happening now in the pol political realm you know maps don't work i don't want to take it off bears and wolves but this uh this scientific discrediting into a politicization of science and wildlife management is for me what's changed and it's bad. And that's why we wrote this and that's why we're worried. Politicians are making the management decisions now, not biologists. And uh, and the biologists are being told not to speak so that their, um, their opinions are not available to the public um, because the politicians don't want the biologists at the state level talking about things. They want it to be um, the decisions and uh, the views of the legislature and the governors. 
And that's not the way it was 35 years ago when we started the recovery program and certainly not when the Wolf program started. So this, this erosion of science and the, and the repression of biologists um, is what's really worrying now. Politicians should not be making management decisions. That's it never works out well when they do on wildlife and wildlife habitat. So I guess that's what you mean in the article when you when you say anti-science. I mean, why would someone want to be what does it mean to be to be anti-science in this context? Well, they have views about things, you know, that are not based in science and facts. For example, that that the wolves, using wolves as a start, are eating all the deer and the elk. And unless we control the wolves and drop the wolf numbers dramatically, that there won't be any elk left. And if we hunt all the wolves down to very low numbers, then there'll be elk everywhere and everybody will be able to get an elk when they go elk hunting. And you know, the relationship between wolves and elk is not that clear cut at all. And um, um, that's one view um, that they want to promote. Another is that, they, you know, wolves um, are eating all the livestock and they're going to threaten the, the livestock industry in the West. And that's nonsense. And we have numbers in the paper about how many livestock are actually killed by wolves. And um you know, those two things are really the basis of the non-science approach of these politicians, that they have to save the deer and the elk from, from wolves and bears, and they have to um, um, drive the wolf numbers down and eliminate bears from a lot of areas, because unless they do, the livestock industry will be threatened. And none of those things, neither of those things are true. And that's anti-science. They're not paying attention to what the facts say. You know, quick anecdote to follow, Chris, and I, I know you guys are supposed to ask the questions, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll make this quick. Um, you know, so I lived in Gardner and I, I worked in the park for 28 years. And and during Wolf Reintroduction, I'm not going to mention names because these individuals probably won't want me to. But I worked with a lot of local people who grew up in Paradise Valley and Gardner, and they were hunters. They had horses. So I would hunt with them because they would let me ride their horses. It was a great way to get in the back country to hunt elk. We're hunting elk together. I'm the wolf guy. They're locals who grew up here. Uh, I think it was a great pairing because our conversations were wonderful. But one thing they told me was this. When they grew up, you need you used to have to ride two weeks to see a cow elk. This is 70s, early 80s. There's no wolves there. They would ride two weeks to see a cow elk, which you could not shoot. You can only shoot a bull. Now, where they hunt, uh, the elk herd is at objective or above it. In you know, a lot of Paradise Valley, where they're talking about the state is saying there's too many elk. Ranchers are upset because of the elk. And now wolves are heavily hunted there, but they are present. So are grizzly bears. Uh, so you have carnivores present, you have elk over objective, uh, you have lots of hunting, and people are upset about wolf recovery and grizzly bears. And yet, when these guys I hunt with uh, grew up, two weeks riding to see one cow elk. So when I hear stories like that, and that's data, I realize it's anecdotal, I'm a little bit like surreal. Sorry for jumping on that. No, please. No, two weeks. Wow. I think that's a lot of the disconnect. Yeah, it's I know. Time, two weeks man. to see an elk. When meanwhile you drive through the 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 entrance to Yellowstone and they're just sitting right there. Um <laughs> there used to be no resident herd north of the park in the 70s. It was all migratory. Elk came from Yellowstone and north. Now there's a, a resident herd that's there year round. Wow. Chris there, there was something that there was a quote in here because now that we're on the topic of hunters a little bit that that's in here that I I, I had to tab it basically where, where you talk about sport hunting of bears teaching bears and I use quotations those of you that can't see me because we're only sharing audio sport hunting does not teach bears to avoid people because bears killed by hunters do not learn anything nor will sport hunting contra contrary to as assertions minimize depredations against private property 
or human bear conflicts within or adjacent to grizzly bear habitat. Where is the disconnect for you? And it's, I'm sure it's a generalized question, but like Doug just, Doug just mentioned about the hunting and the livestock industry, where is the disconnect for those that believe lethal take, lethal management is the only tool in the toolbox and that it will solve all problems, whether it be for bear or wolf? And why, why is that not something that is wholly accurate? Well, the, the reason we put those statements in there is that the state of Montana, uh, their, their Fish and Wildlife Commission, put together uh, in an administrative rule of Montana that, that hunting, this is recent, that, that hunting would be the best way to, or I guess the preferred way to um, reduce numbers of conflicts between livestock and, and bears, reduce the numbers of depredations of bears on human activity, um, balance the numbers of bears with their environment, and reduce the numbers of fatality, human fatalities due to grizzly bears. And all that would result from hunting. And none of those things are true. And there's literature available that shows that you can hunt bears intensively, and it really does not change the number of conflicts between bears and people at all. Um, the, the driver of bear-human conflict is natural food distribution. And in years of bad food, then the bears move in closer to people and they get into trouble and conflicts. It doesn't have anything to do with hunting. Um, human fatalities will not be changed by hunting at all because most human fatalities are where, you know, it's just a surprise encounter. You encounter a bear in a surprise way or get close to a female with cubs, she reacts or the bear reacts um, and um, attacks the person because of a surprise event. Killing bears doesn't change those surprise of events over thousands of square miles of grizzly bear habitat. And, you know, your behavior can actually reduce that by making noise and, you know, hiking in groups and using bear spray, all those things. But hunting would, wouldn't have any effect on that. And the idea that that hunting is going to teach bears to stay away from people. I mean, as Doug said, bears are solitary. They don't hang out in groups. You know, the only groups of bears are females with offspring. And you can't shoot females with offspring anyway as a hunter. And so a solitary bear that shot, um, the death of that bear by a hunter has no effect on the behavior of other bears because they don't know anything about it. They don't like read a bear newspaper and say, you know, Frank got shot. And so <laughs> why did that happen? I mean, there is no relationship Frank. between reduction in conflicts, reduction in fatalities. And um, and yet this is in the Montana um, administrative rule. And they put this in there despite the fact that it's it's false. Um, I wrote him a letter and pointed out the details of why it's false and the science that shows if you kill all the bears you want, it still doesn't reduce conflicts. They completely ignored it, and they didn't even respond to the letter I wrote to them. So, I mean, that's the lack of science that's out there. I mean, this is an agency, a state agency that is promoting things that are patently false in order to mislead the public that hunting is going to be this big panacea and there won't be any more conflicts, there won't be any more fatalities, and bear numbers will be balanced with their, their carrying capacity in the system. None of those things are true. And that's really frustrating for us to see state agencies promoting things that are patently false. And the biologists at the state didn't do this. It's the politicians in the state that wrote this. Why is this for I want to ask this for both of you. Why is this the overarching theme, it seems, for these two species in particular, I, I believe? Because we have had many folks on this podcast. Um, Bob Hayes in particular comes to mind where he really discussed about culling the wolves up in, up in the Yukon area to save the caribou. And... There were some instances uh, in other places, but that, that one really sticks in my mind where the wolves were called to a point that it allowed the herds to rebound and it literally took a year for the herd to come back down to earth. Essentially, it's like they had a little bit of a boon and then it recedes. For both of you and, and whoever wants to take the lead on this and then the other, please piggyback off. Why is this 
the only way forward for for a lot of these things when it when it showed over and over again through time that it's been tried in many different places to save many different types of ungulates and that all it's doing is negatively impacting the ecosystem and then also not really showing that it saves the ungulate herds in any of these states. We can talk about, you know, the Great Lakes region. We can talk about the Yukon Territory. We can talk about, you know, Gritty Yellowstone. Why is this always the go-to? Why is the science just never looked at? I guess, Doug, you can start if you want. Well, I, I guess I will because Bob Hayes was a good friend of mine and we did canoe trips together with our families in the Yukon. And, and so I, I kind of do want to come in on that introduction. Um, your question has many parts to it. The, the, the pearl of it is, you know, wolf control. Um, and that's what Bob, Bob Hayes was hired by the, the government of the Yukon. Uh, and he worked there for 18 years to basically, and, and I like it when things are whittled down to be this clear, but does wolf control work? And, and that was Bob's career uh, there in the Yukon. And, uh, so there was no one better to comment on it. He wrote the book, The Wolves of the Yukon, summarizing his experiences that basically came out in a monograph, or oh, I think it was around 2000, and a couple of subsidiary peer-reviewed papers that he wrote. And the hard part about wolf control, and I think the segue for Chris to talk after me, is Alaska's taking kind of predator control to a new level and that they're killing wolves and bears to basically grow moose caribou and i don't know if it's dull sheep or not but by the way your question when you talk about lake states a lot of the answer depends on the prey that is used like white-tailed deer are a weedy species so wolf deer dynamics in the late stakes are totally different than wolf elk and wolf moose across north america but predator control on wolves at least i'll leave bears out of it is has been used widely it's being used to save mountain caribou in bc in Alberta right now. Um, it's been used in Alaska for decades. Uh, it's been used in other places and it works. When you kill all the wolves or even predators, bears included, you, you get more prey usually, not always. Although Bob found in the Southwestern Yukon, you gotta know what your limiting factor is. Chris just referred to the relationship between wolves and elk in Montana is not clear, he's right. Unfortunately, this is the way science is, this is the way life is, maybe thankfully, that you have to study every system. Every system has its own nuances and differences. So one of Bob's major points was he had three major study areas across the Yukon Territory. You need to know what your limiting factor is for the prey population. And he was studying moose, caribou, and dull sheep. And the answer for each of those species was different. And where it was in the southwestern Yukon Territory, which is influenced by the ocean and precipitation, your limiting factor was snow, not predators. So if you go out and kill wolves and bears, it does nothing to grow in your moose population, nothing. Your, your limiting factor was winter weather. You go to the northern Yukon Territory, killing wolves uh, produced more moose uh, and in other places caribou. But what you said in, in your question was, and Bob wrote about this, and his conclusion was basically it's not worth it, is it's an ephemeral effect. Bob, a, a friend of mine who died uh, years ago, conducted the same work that Bob did only in Alaska. His name was Bill Gassaway. He wrote a monograph on this in the early 80s, and it was the same conclusion. Predator control will work, but it's to the level of killing 80 to 90 percent of them. Do you really want to do that? And what happens as soon as you stop, two things happen. The reproductive rate on the animals left or the animals that immigrate in from outside where you didn't kill them have a very high reproductive rate. And within three to five years, they replace the population was there. And so even though there are data that show that massive, and I underline massive predator killing, does produce more prey. This is something you have to do forever. And so it's killing in the long term. It's very expensive. I think Bob lined out what a pound of moose meat costs after you fly around in helicopters for three to five years, blowing away most of the wolves. 
and I think they killed some bears too, that that pound of moose meat, you know, you might as well go to the grocery store and, you know, cost of things in rural Yukon territory, even Whitehorse, Watson Lake, Dawson are expensive anyway. Your beef is still going to be cheaper than that moose that, oh, by the way, the government subsidized. So the question comes down to, do we want to turn our northern ecosystems into massive killing fields for decades uh, that costs a lot of money? And that's what, what Bob's conclusion to his book, Wolves of the Yukon, was. And he basically said it's just not worth it. Um, now, Alaska and the Yukon could not be more different. There's a line there. And Alaska's approach to wildlife management is very different than Yukon's. No aerial control in the Yukon now. I think some of that is due to Bob Hayes' legacy. Wolves are hunted and trapped as a prized game species. Indigenous peoples, that's very important to them. But And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's this aerial control that is very different from Alaska to the Yukon. In Alaska, it's, it's a tool that they use frequently. No aerial killing in the Yukon right now. I, I can't say the same thing about further east, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, who are in a massive barren ground caribou decline. Not anything due to predators, but oh, of course, you've got to blame predators somehow, and they're doing wolf control there as well, or, or bounties or very uh, in, incentivized killing programs. So anyway, it didn't, you know, you touched a nerve with Bob, who dedicated his career to something. And and like I'm following Chris's lead, he's been retired longer than me. I, I feel what Bob went through when you hang it up, you can speak out a little bit more and you see what a career thinking about this stuff uh, ends up meaning. <laughs> I, I'm sorry about that, but there, there's some great <laughs> examples about predator control and about spending your life trying to do something and you learn about it in depth. And that's what Bob did with wolf control. Yeah, you're supposed to be retired, Doug. Now you're, what are you doing, Jim? Uh, Chris told me this is what I'm supposed to do. I called him months after I retired, and he says, Doug, this is what you're supposed to do. That's a true story, Chris. You did do that. <laughs> I'm Doug's advisor now. <laughs> I thought it was the other way around. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's tremendous. Oh, that's uh, so Chris, good. you got to rip off of that, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I agree. I think, you know, if you kill a lot of any predator, the only way that you can relieve the pressure of those predators is to continue to kill them all the time. Because if you create this vacuum, then they're going to fill it. Reproduc yeah. uh, reproduction is going to increase. Uh, survival of sub-adults is going to increase. And cub survival is going to increase. And immigration animals are going to enter into the vacuum that you created. And Alaska has killed, I think, 90 bears last year, and they're killing at least that many this year with helicopter gunning. And uh, they're killing whole family groups in order to save a caribou herd. And the cost of that in terms of money is huge. And it's only going to work if they continue to do that all the time. And, um, you know, Killing bears to save caribou is just a, it's something that is going to lead them down the path of admitting that we're going to have to do this all the time or admitting it's a total failure. Um, uh, I don't know which one they're going to get to, but they, I, again, this year, they're out there killing bears from helicopters and wolves. So is it a, it's an ignorance of science or, or a rejection? I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's, um, you know, they're kind of caught in this rut that they somehow sold the idea that they can control the predators and save the caribou. And uh, they probably increase the caribou numbers somewhat by intensive culling of wolves and bears. But the only way they're going to be able to continue that is to continue to kill all these animals on a regular basis. And, um, you know, it's not it's not hunting. It's um, it's extermination policy. And uh, you know, I I hope we never get to that in the lower 48 states. Aerial gunning. I, I got to say one thing. I, I, I go up there a lot. Alaska, Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, for its wilderness values, for its wildness. When you kill like that, as Chris just said, extermination, it loses its wilderness values. It You know, you go to the wild country, you, you go to the Yukon Territory, they sell the idea of wilderness and wild country. When you kill predators at that scale, 
it becomes basically free ranging livestock management. The moose, the caribou, the dull sheep, uh, they, they become like free ranging livestock. It's no longer a wild system, the allure of the North, you know, the Robert service, the jet, you know, when, when Bob Hayes did his podcast with you, he mentioned Jack London, that magic and that mystique is gone when, oh, it's a heavily managed and manipulated human lands landscape. We love these trophy moose, doll sheep, caribou, but we got it because of massive killing right. forever. I mean, Doug, are you, are you nervous in any way that Montana as this beacon of wildlife and wilderness and conservation in the lower 48 is, is, is changing? I mean, I mean, years ago before visiting Montana, I had it in my mind that that was the destination, you know, to experience wilderness and, and predator prey dynamics. I mean, as close to what they might have been hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago, and that they really were the the one state in the lower 48 preserving the wilderness of the past and, and being introduced to these concepts the last few years, it seems like maybe that's, that's changing. Well, I mean, comparing this latitude of the West to the far North is, is difficult. And, and, and certainly there's uh, more undeveloped land, the further North you go. Um, but I, I think, a good answer to that, maybe not the best answer, is Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, one of the few areas of the continental United States where you have a chance or you have robust large carnivore communities. And I think that does make the region special, as you just said. Um, and so I think as citizens here and as wildlife biologists, we need to recognize that it drives our tourism just like in the north um and i think we've done a good job of coexistence up until now uh we've balanced elk and deer and livestock needs with having a large carnivore community and you know the far north has that but actually in some ways you know per unit area we we have more carnivores the yellowstone ecosystem the crown of the continent ecosystem you know some places in central idaho have higher densities of, of grizzly bears, wolves, cougars, uh, black bears, these, these large carnivores. Um, you know, the, the, the North's uh, advantage is, is expanse, is vast land, but it's all low density. You know, you go a long ways in between wolf packs and a long ways in between grizzly bear sightings. Not so down here, but, you know, because the latitudinal effect on productivity increases the density. And so I think the comparison, there are a lot of things to compare, but I, I think what's important about it is we are that wild beachhead that you said you came here for. Let's do a, let's take care of it. You know, it's, it's Chris's opening comments were very poignant. We brought it back amidst conflict. You know, the crackheads and the park service hated each other. You know, the dumps, we can't close them. Let's do it slowly. All that debate, they worked through it and look what happened. This is another one of those moments that we've got to again, take a gut check and say, this region of the United States has something special. Let's not blow it. Chris, why do you think, to piggyback of what Doug just said, why do you believe, what do you see in comparison to when you started through all your work and now, you know, in retirement, where do you believe the disconnect happened between people, I, I guess, working together for, for a commonality or for a common goal for preservation and conservation? Where do you think that line stopped and it, and the, and it became pendulum swings into the severe or extreme in either direction? Why do you think folks are not willing to work together, put aside differences and fate, like Doug said, preserve the places that are promoted in these states, like, you know, Wyoming, Montana, you know, in the great North? 
Well, when we started the Grizzly Bear Recovery Program, the politicians, remember, signed the MOU to implement the Grizzly Bear Recovery Plan, the governors of the four states. And so the governors were behind and and the politicians were behind the idea of recovering these animals. And the um, um, the decisions were made by biologists. And uh, during the uh, probably 2010 period on, uh, we began to transition from um, emphasis on recovering grizzly bears to an emphasis on delisting grizzly bears. In other words, taking the Endangered Species Act away. And um, the focus on many politicians is now um, to remove the oppressive yoke of the Endangered Species Act from the state so that they can make the decisions on their own. Um, you know, in the big picture of things, if we're going to maintain grizzly bears on the landscape, they're not going to be that much different under listed or delisted status. Um, but um, the worry that we have, Doug and I and many others, is they're going to do to grizzly bears after, you know, if grizzly bears were delisted, they're going to do the same thing to grizzly bears that they're currently doing to wolves. And that is to try to drive the numbers down and the area where the animals occupy to reduce those areas into small pockets, say the, the core recovery areas and the Yellowstone and the other ecosystems. You know, it's based on a, just an intolerance of, of predators that is not based on fact. It's this emotional thing, you know, that, you know, if grizzly bears, grizzly bears are going to eat all the livestock or they're going to eat all the deer and the elk or they're going to maul everybody. Uh, Grizzly, most grizzly bears don't have conflicts with livestock. They don't eat. They're very ineffective carnivores. They can eat elk for about two weeks until the elk calves get to be really mobile. And then the elk calves can outrun them. And the conflicts with people are really minimal. You know, you've got millions of people recreating in grizzly bear habitat every year. And the numbers of people that get injured by grizzly bears, you could probably count on one hand. It's a very small number of, of conflicts. Um, but these pro politicians tend to promote the negative and um, the emotional, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal bureaucrats that don't know anything about Montana are telling us how to manage grizzly bears. That's not true at all. These management systems that are in place have been developed by the state and the federal biologists in concert. They haven't really... Um, um, changed over time, or they won't change over time if we're going to keep these animals on the landscape. So, you know, it's if you pull it all together, it's this kind of political hysteria that is created since, uh, I'd say, maybe the, the last five years, it's gotten really bad. And um, it kind of mirrors what's happened at the national political level, where um, departure from facts is a common tactic by politicians you know, to evoke um, emotions in the voters. Um, you know, we got to get rid of the wolves. We've got to get rid of the grizzly bears, you know, and the voters often get manipulated by the politicians in order to get them into, you know, voting for them about, um, you know, reelect me and we'll delist the grizzly bear. And, you know, the governor of Montana, his big effort was to delist grizzly bears so that he could get reelected in this his second term, which is coming up this year. And, um, you know, he kind of hinged his whole political career on delisting the grizzly bear and getting control back. And, you know, that's that's where we are. They're manipulating the, the public's knowledge and the public's um, awareness about these animals for political gain. And that's the danger of having politicians make decisions about wildlife. When you both look at the ESA, is it something that is being weaponized or is a hindrance? I know, Doug, we spoke about this with wolves a little bit too, about the numbers. And maybe, Chris, you can shed light maybe on the grizzly bear uh, recovery numbers too. There's always this sense that wolves can be driven down to X number because that was the number proposed in the recovery. 150, 10 packs, whatever it was. Do you, either of you see that as something that can be weaponized, is weaponized, used in a way to back the anti-predator sentiment and not used as a baseline and 
where people are, are using it and say, see, we set these numbers, we are massively over objective with these predators. So therefore, we can extirpate them down to a certain level, and everything should still be okay. Yeah, I'll take a stab first, I guess. That's another loaded question. And it, I could ramble a long time, but I won't or try not to. Um, but you know, the whole process to delist wolves is slightly different than bears. Uh, I want Chris to correct me if I say anything wrong, but I'm going to call bears fragile and I'm going to call wolves forgiving. Um, and so the history of wolves is driven by controversy and social conflict. And so a lot of wolf biologists, and this is a hard part about studying wolves, is you begin wanting to be a scientist and mid-career you become a, a, a natural scientist and a social scientist because you can't study wolves for very long before you're inundated with the social, political, human side of things. And so that attitude infiltrates a scientific mind that whenever you go from studying wolves to managing them, the question always comes up, what are we going to be able to get? <laughs> because, you know, there's always this kind of, at some point, wolves exceed social caring capacity. There's going to be more of them to hit biological caring capacity. Dave Meach and I have had big debates about wolf population regulation. And the center of our debate is we just had a paper come out. Well, me and Brenna Cassidy opposing one of Dave's ideas, and he's frantically writing a paper against us, but it hinges on wolves rising to the food level. And there are pearls of truth to that, but it's not that simple. I won't get into that debate, but they're driven by food. That density is rarely achieved on human-dominated landscapes. So social carrying capacity is what drives wolf numbers. So back to the Endangered Species Act, the extraordinarily low number of wolves that was determined for the final rule in the tri-state area was driven by that thinking. If we're going to recover wolves, we better not overdo it because there'll be a backlash from the public. And besides that, if you give wolves half a chance, they'll do just fine. Because again, comparing them with a the grizzly bear, uh, you know, they're, they're more resilient to human caused mortality. Now, not entirely. I think populationally, they can take a fair amount of human killing. And that is always the tool to gain social acceptance. When there's problems, kill them. And so the design behind recovery in the tri-state area, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, was let's not exceed social tolerance. If we keep wolf numbers low, we crop them. When they get too many, I think the public will tolerate them. And now what's happened in all three states, most especially Idaho and Montana, they're well above this minimum population. And I would like to see, and this came through in our piece, um, was management driven by issues and problems, not oh, the, the floor is three times 100, actually. That's all that's required. They're managing for 50 more, three times 150 uh, for, for, you know, a buffer. But, you know, Idaho and Montana are saying, well, we're, you know, we're well over that number, which is true. But why not manage for the appropriate number socially and biologically rather than saying, oh, the feds determined this very low number that we're going to drive them to, if we're successfully living with them at larger numbers, I, I would like to see decisions made more around that thinking than, oh, feds only said three times 100. That came about because of this age old ancient view that uh, you better not want to get too many wolves because at some point they're going to explode in the public's face and they're going to hate them. And to this day, prominent wolf biologists believe the only way you can have wolves is with aggressive problem solving, usually by killing. I, I won't cite the papers in the literature, but they're there. And so this is the tough, tough side of wolves. But I would just like to see them managed more like uh, wildlife instead of vermin. And, and that deals with, and I just got back from Europe, coming up with better population estimates, and they're doing it in Europe. They have excellent method, uh, methods over there. 
capture recapture models for large areas. And when you know, have a more Something precise, else. accurate population estimate, it allows you to make better management decisions. Right now, management is all we got to have is 100. As long as we show that, doesn't matter how good our estimate is, especially when you're well above it. If you're well above it, we don't need to know because all we need is 100. And if you can prove 100, they just went through a status review with the Fish and Wildlife Service. No action was taken because they're well above this final rule determined number. Again, and I was, I reviewed the final rule. I'm culpable for that as well. I just think this deserves some some thought and conversation is all I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, when the articles started circulating that there were objectives of, you know, 90% reduction of Idaho's wolf population, we, I mean, we wondered if that was even really an achievable objective, meaning given how hard wolves are to hunt and the, and the way they breed, is that a plausible reality? Can that happen really? Or is it sort of a, a statement to communicate something else? I know some wolf biologists say, no, you couldn't do that without, well, I don't want to say without, there's different methods you could use to really cut them back. And those methods are very repugnant in their, what Chris and I wrote about in the article, it, it's, you know, 1800s vintage methods. Can you get them down to 10% of what they are now with, with hunting and trapping? Uh, that would be tough. I think you could you could go a long ways getting them low, and you wouldn't really have what I would call a wolf population. You would have a highly ravaged and torn apart bunch of wolves running around the landscape, uh, struggling to reproduce each year in any method they can. And, and you know that's the hard part of our wolves. You'd probably still have wolves, but to me, they wouldn't be considered a natural population at all. And I think for all wildlife species, even heavily hunted species like elk and deer, you have to allow them to be themselves at some point through not over hunting them too much. And I, I think you could really do damage with too much hunting and trapping. Could you get them reduced by 90% without more aggressive methods? That would be hard. That would be hard. But the way we're seeing uh, wildlife management nowadays, people are probably, you know, that all methods are fine, you know, and that's one thing that we're worried about. Why we're trying to wave our hands right now with this paper is that let's think, let, let's stop this before it gets too too run away. Chris, is it is it the same? Do you feel the same way? Obviously, about the the grizzly bear because that this has been floated, you know, for I feel like for months or it seems like years, but it might be a short amount of time about the delisting of of the grizzly bear and feeling that this could go the way of what wolves are facing right now and that they're in this in-between of delisting, listing, delisting, listing. Do you fear that for grizzly bears in the in the future, in the upcoming future, because of how you've seen this rhetoric play out? Well, remember, I was the, um, the recovery coordinator for a long time, and I actually wrote the first delisting rule for Yellowstone and defended it in court. And I was a proponent of delisting grizzly bears because I had confidence that the grizzly bears were going to be managed by the state biologists based on facts and science. And I thought when the state guys, in cooperation with the federal guys, say at the Park Service, are using science and facts to manage grizzly bears, that the grizzly bears will be fine on the landscape. Um, and so I promoted that. But as we discussed earlier in the podcast, now we're seeing these decisions being made by politicians, not being made by, by biologists anymore. And so we don't have science and facts being used to manage grizzly bears. And that would not be what happens after delisting. Right now, the, 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 the listing of grizzly bears provides a buffer for the bears on the landscape because the state politicians can't do all the things they want to do. Remember that, that recovery of an animal under the Endangered Species Act is not just the numbers of animals. It requires that adequate regulatory mechanisms be in place. And the adequate regulatory mechanisms affect two things, the habitat and making sure that the habitat the animals need is still available to them on the landscape. And if you think about bears, you know, think about things like road closures, management of motorized access routes, um, uh, 
management of activities like logging and, and recreation so that it doesn't um, remove bears or uh, bears have to avoid all these things on, on public lands. And then adequate regulatory mechanism primarily addresses the issue of mortality and how mortalities of grizzly bears can occur on the landscape. And the, the problem we see with grizzly bears is that all these aggressive ways to kill wolves are also going to end up killing grizzly bears. And there is no adequate regulatory mechanism for these aggressive ways to kill wolves, neck snaring of wolves, trapping of wolves. Um, all these things are also going to end up killing grizzly bears. And the, the promotion of these things to kill wolves in places where grizzly bears are is an inadequate regulatory mechanism. And that in and of itself should prevent the delisting of grizzly bears. So that's an issue. And also, you know, think about where grizzly bears are on the landscape. You know, we have recovery zones. We have them in the in the core areas of the Yellowstone ecosystem, in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. And now we have bear populations that are occurring. We have dispersers that are outside those areas. The states, none of the states have given any evidence of what they plan to do with those bears outside. Um, other than the state of Montana, they, did, they drafted a, um, a draft grizzly bear management plan to be used after delisting. And that essentially was a plan of intolerance that said that grizzly bears would be killed in areas that the politicians didn't want them. And even on public land, they would be killed. Even if they weren't in conflicts with livestock or humans, they would be killed. And even family groups would be killed. So females with cubs would be killed in these places outside the core areas. Um, that plan was roundly criticized. And that's over 18 months ago, they put that out and they haven't said a word about it since. And it's really troubling to wonder what it is they're really planning to do. Um, if the grizzly bears were delisted, what would the states do with all the bears outside? Would they promote intolerance like that plan did and draft? So the inadequacy of regulatory mechanisms in general and the fact that all these wolf killing methods are gonna result in dead bears um, is of great concern to us. And we outline that in the paper. Um, without adequate regulatory mechanisms, grizzly bears are very vulnerable because they reproduce very slowly. And it's easy to kill grizzly bears and to knock their numbers back very rapidly because they're so, they lack resilience to excessive mortality. Hey, did you guys maybe should give the citation to your viewers of the paper uh, in the Yellowstonian, what was it, the June issue, I think, uh, it's a new publication put up by Todd Wilkinson. Yeah, no, we're gonna have the we're gonna have the paper in the uh, in the description. We'll, we'll we're gonna promote that for for sure once you know once it's out. I I only have a couple more things I think for you guys. And again, we appreciate the time and and really the the scope of this conversation from both of you. I, I want to go back to to elk numbers and ungulate numbers really fast because it's something I, I missed to touch on there. With the overabundance or or the above objective, I'll say, of elk, uh, especially because this this seems to be obviously um, a talking point for for many. Mo you know, we we've talked about stuff that's happened in Wyoming and and Idaho and Montana, and all of these elk numbers are being above objective, giving out unlimited tags, things that you know we can hunt you know elk year round. You can take unlimited elk because there are so many. And you guys did discuss some of the impacts that livestock owners or farmers, anybody that are seeing with those populations. Why is there such an aversion to using the natural predators, the natural colors of the ecosystem, if you will, to move these herds around, to prey on the sick, to keep CWD, you know, maybe not, you know, fully keep it away from the West, but at least call it to, to a point where, we won't have a situation where they'll say we have to pay these hunters and all these people to kill these massive elk herds because CWD is now rampant X, Y, and Z. Why is the intolerance there? I know there's probably a very simple answer to it, but you have mm -hmm. these natural coexisting predators that their job is literally to make sure things are in balance. I'll start Chris with you and then Doug go off of that. What, why is there this hesitancy to use the two the natural tools that are already there. 
to help in these situations? Well, um, I think it's basically, that's a wolf question um, because grizzly bears are really ineffective at killing elk, except when the, there's elk calves around. So uh, I'll defer to Doug to, to let him expound as to why people are not um, allowing wolves to, to manage the elk. I mean, one, one issue just before I, I sure. hand it off to Doug is a lot of the numbers of high numbers of elk are in places where there aren't any wolves. Um, Eastern Montana, for example. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, no, I mean, there's not. it's not a long answer. It's an age-old bias against predators. And, you know, in some ways, wolves lead the anti-predator bias. Um, you know, okay, the state of Montana's estimate for wolves is roughly around 1,100 plus or minus, actually, I don't know what the conference interval is. That's not enough wolves to impact elk across the state of Montana. I mean, there's more black bears and cougars than wolves. Um, there are some hunting districts in Montana, a minority of them that are below objective. I know Idaho less because I don't live or, or hunt there. Um, they're, they're a small number and they're usually the hunting districts that are, are, are wilderness districts that don't have a lot of agriculture, which do help elk and deer. And they usually have both species of bears, cougars and wolves present. That doesn't mean they have a huntable offtake for humans. It's probably less. I think people like, and then, you know, region one of Montana, which is heavily forested. And, you know, it's harder to get a cow elk tag there. Like you can get cow elk tags across the rest of the state. So the folks there who are died hard hunters are like, we want that too. Uh, be able to cow hunt. And, and so, you know, it's a scale issue across the state. Montana is 40, 50,000 elk over their state objective. Um, there's counties that are suing FWP for too many elk. But I think what people like to trot out are these small hunt unit examples to point at the finger and go, see, this is what predators do. Or if you live in a region that there's no cow hunting, and it's hard to get a bull elk, it's those diagon wolves. And why do they immediately say wolves? It's because of our cultural bias against them that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. And that's deeply ingrained in our culture. I mean, you cannot believe the misinformation and the thinking behind wolves that occurs. It's the first thing people jump to. And so I think it's a cultural values problem not necessarily a biological one, but the data I just cited, you know, show the complexity of, oh, it must be wolves. Right. Chris, I want to ask you, and then I'll go to Doug. If you were, I don't want to say give the elevator pitch, but for anybody who's going to be reading this, and I, we, you know, I would say anybody who's listening to this podcast, we will have the link for the article please read the article. Um, these two men know what they're talking about. They have such uh, plenty of information, graphs and charts and things like that. Please read this article about their, their, you know, what the things they're trying to say here. If you were to give somebody one thing in this article that maybe we didn't touch on or, or something that you want them to get out of this, what is that from your perspective, Chris? The, the the future of bears and wolves in the northern Rockies is currently at risk because of um, the fact that politicians are deeply involved in the management of these species and um, and the risk to these animals is real. Um, you know they are establishing objectives to drive populations of wolves, for example, down. Uh, whether they can do it or not is is questionable, but they're, it's their objective. Um, and they're they're ignoring the facts about, you know, what wolves and bears do on the landscape. And they seem to be ignoring the fact that wolves and bears are part of the natural capital of the Northern Rockies. These animals are the reason that millions of tourists come to the Northern Rockies. And they bring hundreds of millions of dollars to local communities. And somehow they're being demonized by the politicians for, for short, um, short range 
benefits like getting elected and uh, the big picture that these animals are extremely valuable to these states and the people who who have businesses in the states in these states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming are unique in that they're places where these these big predators still live in the lower 48 states. These are rare places, and that's why the people come here. I mean, the number one things that people see want to see when they go to Yellowstone are bears and wolves. Um, that's what all those people come for. That's why they're up at 5.30 in the morning in Lamar Valley. You know, there's hundreds of people and their families that are up at 5.30 in the morning in Lamar Valley. They never get up at that hour otherwise, but they're out in the valley to see animals in the wild. That is a huge and important and really valuable thing. What do you got, Doug? Anything off piggyback off that? No, not really, because that was a great answer. But I, I think what, I mean, Wolf Recovery was a bipartisan effort. You know, Jim McClure in Idaho is the one who wanted reintroduction because it 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 allowed you to relax some of the stringency of the Endangered Species Act. Jim McClure, you know, a Republican, uh, William Mott under the Reagan, he was director of the Park Service. He had the the button that said the eyes do it. I, I forget exactly what I have one in my desk, but the, the eyes don't work anymore. You know, and then, of course, it was done under the Clinton administration. You know, uh, George H.W. Bush's administration did uh, the Wolves for Yellowstone. That was congressionally mandated. Uh, this was a work together example of wildlife recovery, you know, uh, kind of what happened to that. I mean, that's that's the thing I want to add to what Chris said. But the other thing that I think is important, and we put this in the piece, is the management now of these large carnivores is an erosion of trust in the public. You know, the, 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 the public is already distrustful of the federal government. This, this adds to it. Um, you know, the grizzly, grizzly bears are standing behind wolves. If management of wolves is going to be like this, um, we don't want grizzly bears delisted because this is just a scene of things to come. And, you know, so this leads to more polarization because, as Chris said, he led the effort on delisting bears, which in general can allow more social acceptance because it's local management, not far away Washington, D.C. or Denver management. The locals and if the locals are making informed, scientifically based decisions, that is a good thing. But the way wolves have been handled and some of the unresponsiveness to, I would, I don't know the exact data, but I bet you a majority of Montanans um, <clears throat> are in favor of wolves, you know, and yet they're not being hurt. You know, they don't have a voice. And I think that leads to this distrust of government that if we can't impact management, if you're not responsive to data, <clears throat> Why would, you know, they're worried. And I think the grizzly bears, that's a lot of the opposition to delisting because, oh, wow, if this is how it's going to go with wolves, um, we don't want you guys to be have more control. Um, I, I think that's an important point as well, the trusting. And we did put that in the ar article. Yeah, a small percentage of, of people that actually hunt wolves is detailed in the article. And, you know, these politicians are are manipulating the 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 attitudes of the public based on the desires of a really small number of people that want to kill wolves. 80% of the Montana population doesn't hunt anything at all. And um, the vast majority of people in these states do not hunt anything. And a minuscule number of them are out trying to trap and 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 shoot wolves. And uh, we're, we've politicize the whole idea of hunting. And that is really, really um, disturbing to us too. I mean, Doug and I are both big game hunters and, um, you know, hunting is, I mean, it's like 97% of the American public doesn't hunt big game. And, you know, to erode the idea of the hunter that hunters are out there killing wolves because there's too many of them. And, and we hate wolves because, you know, we want more elk. Um, you know, killing wolves with these methods, shooting wolves over bait at night with spotlights, um, running wolves down with snow machines. This is all um, 
not ethical. It is a violation of fair chase that hunters, you know, adhere to, most hunters adhere to. And these people that are doing this to wolves are are um, damaging the image of all hunters in the eyes of the vast majority of the public that doesn't hunt anything. And, you know, hunting has been turned into a political tool by these politicians. Hunting should not be a political tool. It should be a fair chase exercise of sportsmanship. And the way that wolves are, are being killed is not fair chase. It's not sporting and it's, it's wrong. And it erodes the image of hunters in everybody's eyes. I, yeah, I mean, we, we agree. And I, I was looking up the, the numbers that you guys have in this article, and I just want to point those really quick. I think you guys have in here only 4.4% of Americans hunt big game animals as sport hunters, 7,000 active wolf hunters in Montana. So that's 0.62% of Montana residents. Uh, the Montana draft, yeah, the draft Mo Montana wolf plan states there are approximately 1,700 trapping licenses issue with wolf certification, which is 0.15% of Montana residents. There are approximately 250 active wolf trappers, which is 0.022% of Montana residents. The number of all paid hunting license holders in Montana in 2024 was 237,339. Active wolf hunters make up 2.94% of paid hunting license holders in Montana and active wolf trappers make up 0.11% of paid hunting licenses. So yeah, it's a vocal minority. And like you said, I think the unintended consequences of that is that there are many hunters such as yourselves, along with yourselves, that it gives this broad brush that all hunters are the same. And that is clearly not the case. And we, um, I'm glad that you pointed that out, Chris, at the end, um, that this was, you know, that's also something to look at is that we have these very small numbers that are making these decisions and are impacting these wild places, this wildlife um, on a level that, you know, I don't think we've ever seen. My last thing for you, Chris, and I'll ask Doug this question again, but uh, something we do at the end. Um, and since you are the bear guy, I'll say for you, when you hear the word bear, what is the thing that comes to mind for you? Um, um, uh, uh, an image of wildness. I mean, when bears are on the landscape, it's a wild place. And where I go to see bears are wild places. And when I see a bear, like in the back country, say in the scapegoat or the Bob Marshall wilderness, I mean, I see it in the wildest place and it makes my trip. And, you know, the, the magic that comes with seeing bears every time I see one, it's, you know, I can recount probably hundreds of stories of the times that I've seen bears. And because every time you see a bear, it's a grizzly bear, it's a really magical experience. And watching them do their thing out there, particularly when they're doing their thing without knowing you're around. You watch them at a distance, you know, with binoculars and watch them turning over rocks and digging up moss or digging in a, 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 you know, a meadow, digging up roots or, you know, playing with each other or the things that bears do and allowing bears to do those things on the landscape is, is one of the things that happens when we have a recovered population. And and one of the few places, there are some of those few places left where the bears do that in the lower 48 states in these these yeah, states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. And those are really magical places. Those are special places. We shouldn't persecute these animals because they live on the landscape. They're not demons. They're just natural species that live. They've been living here long before we Europeans got here to chase them around. Absolutely. Doug, for you? When you hear the word wolf, what's the thing that comes to your mind? Well, that was an eloquent answer <laughs> that I'm going to riff off of because yeah, to, to me, wolves mean wildness. And, you know, when I was young and didn't know much, I went to the north to find true wildness. And wolves were part and parcel to that. I mean, I initially went to Alaska, but later drifted more uh, towards Canada. And it's those landscapes where you have a feeling of the, the hand of humans is minor. It, it, it's not driving what you see and what you feel. And that changes everything. And that those landscapes 
have wolves and grizzly bears, black bears, usually not cougars because you too find right. Even coyotes are kind of not there. But those three are, especially grizzly bears and wolves. So to me, they're they're kind of symbols of not only the north, but intact ecosystems. You know, they're they're a little, how do I say this, intolerant of the human takeover of the planet. And I think that's, you know, we talk about elk and deer and, and livestock and all that kind of stuff. But the things that grizzly bears and wolves need the most is space. They're not backyard wildlife. And, you know, the populations of this northern Rockies region that we've been talking about is growing. And everybody wants their 10-acre ranchette. Wolves and grizzly bears don't do well with that. They they need this vastness. They need the space, if for no other reason, just to reduce conflict. And so to me, they're a red flag to say, stop humans, you know, well, what are we stopping? The human takeover of the planet and this, what, you know, Chris just said it beautifully. And I'll finish with this. Bob Hayes, great friend, you know, the late Bob Hayes, you know, in his podcast with you guys, he talks about as a kid liking Jack London. What's Jack London about? The, 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 this this northern aura that you go, you know, my kid's been in Alaska and the Yukon Territory the last month. He's on his way back when he calls and texts. It's this whole northern aura of wildness. It makes it a better trip. And it makes it a better would place. Would you have live. that if you didn't have wolves there and grizzly bears there? No. It would just be scenery. It would be not the Jack London that Bob Hayes is talking about. It would not be that land where you tingle when you're going through it. My kid just did it. I did it when I was the exact same age. And it hooks you. It's addictive. It's a drug. But what's the drug? Wild. Take the bears and wolves out. You got nothing. Yeah. And you, I mean, I think more folks would relate to that because we are, we do prioritize our autonomy and our, our freedom. But I think you nailed something there too, that the predator's resistance to obey, to conform to this kind of future of wildlife farming that it seems we're, we're headed towards. And I wonder if maybe that's a lot of what's going on. You know, I'm a hunter, as Chris said, but I'm a recreational hunter. Right. If I don't get something, I go to the grocery store. <laughs> so I'm walking around with my gun in the woods. Right. My spine's tingling because that deer elk might show up. If I don't get to take the shot, it's okay. But I get to have wolves and bears in the landscape to share it with them. And it makes it a better hunt. Man. Really. Uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to have you both on here to discuss this. Uh, those of you that are listening, the article will be in the description. Doug Smith, Chris Servin, thank you guys so much for this morning and just this incredible discussion. Really, thank you all for what you've done and that you're continuing to do. Really appreciate yeah, you both. Thank you. Hang tight while we sign off. How's to you all out there? We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Looking for more information about Wolf Connection or the podcast? please visit our website at wolfconnection.org where you can donate, sponsor a wolf, or become a volunteer.